There we go. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessings you give to us. We thank you for our time of study this morning. Help us to carefully reflect upon the, the word revealed. Help us to make application in our life. Help us to be better servants in this darkened world. Father, we love you and we praise you. Please be with our shepherds. Please be with us in our efforts to evangelize the world around us. Give us opportunities to share the good news and the courage to do it. And we pray that you'll be glorified in our efforts this morning and certainly in our worship to come. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so Ephesians 6, we're down to the last three classes here. We're going to work off of verses 1 through 9 in class right now, and then we'll jump into verses 10 through the end of the chapter in class on Wednesday, and the plan is to finish that up the following Sunday. And so we'll, we'll spend two classes on that bigger section there and, of course, try to give some application and some thought to that section. So... Ephesians 6, verse 1. Let's begin reading. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. All right, questions. We've got the entire first seven questions of this chapter to work through. Question number one. What responsibility do children have to their parents and why? Obey because it's right. Obey because it's right. Question number two. What does the concept of honor your parents suggest in verses two and three? Honor your parents. What does that suggest? Grow integrity. Grow integrity. Okay. Obey. Obey. Okay. Respect. Respect. Oh, there we go. I, that's the word I was looking for. Respect, to honor is in some ways to respect. That's not the only nuance. That is a big part of this discussion, though, especially in this context. Respect your parents. Question number three, what must the fathers do? I want you to think about that. We, we, often, we often take this verse and we kind of wrestle around with it and make it say some stuff that it's not actually saying. So verse 4, what must the father do? Do not provoke your children. Now I want you to be careful with this next question. Does this only apply to fathers? No. No. But I'm going to say it now. We'll say it again when we get into the text. It is specifically addressed to fathers. There is a side application here where, the impl where it's implied both parents have to be careful about this. But guys, the fact that he points out fathers in particular is a very important point. I want you to notice, uh, and I'll make, I'm going to make the point now because I want to. Look at verse 1. Obey your parents. Verse 4, fathers do not provoke your children to wrath. Guys, he has a word in his arsenal that would spe uh, specify both parents. You see that? And yet he purposefully uses the, the uh, paternal word to denote fathers in particular. Okay? We often look at this text and we say, both parents, both parents. That's true. Don't lose sight of who he specifies fathers. And there is a big reason for that. Okay? 
I just want to plant that thought in your head now, and when we go working through the text, I'll explain part of what I'm saying and why I'm saying it. When we get into the applications, I'm going to zero in even harder on that point. Um, this is my speciality, because I'm a father. I can't help the woman stuff, okay, okay. I got lots of daughters, uh, so maybe I could help in some respects. I can't tell you a whole lot about some of those other int uh, intricacies of all that. Father stuff, been doing that a little while. Lots of y'all have more experience than me, but I I I'm liking that one, all right? Let's move along here. Question number four. What duty do the bond servants have to their masters? What duty do the bond servants have to their masters? Be obedient. Very good, Sister Brown. Be obedient. Question number five. What does not with eye service as men pleasers mean? What does that phrase mean? Okay. Ultimately, it's about our obedience to God. Absolutely. Hypocritical. There we go. That's a good way to look at this. A hypocritical service. Guys, I want you to just kind of, sometimes this is, the way the Bible words things is so foreign to the way we would word it. We, we kind of struggle with that sometimes. But, but just think about this. Eye service is something that's being done just to make it look good. As men pleasers. So, you know, it very, very much is a hypocritical service, a hypocritical action. I mean, if we want to think nuts and bolts of master and slave mentality and relational stuff, here's the slave who's doing this while the master watches. Oh, boy, he's the go-getter while the master's watching. You know, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. The minute the master turns his back, he is a different person. Okay? That's kind of that point. Uh, Dennis? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want you to think about this. Obedience, whether they're there or not. Why do you think something like this matters? A slave needs to obey his master as if he is serving God. Well, I want you to think about this. Okay? This is sometimes very simple and we don't think about it enough. A slave should obey his master. He sees his master. He interacts with his master. He ha his master has a physical presence, okay? Now think about this. Ultimately, the slave is to serve his master because of the true master. He doesn't always see the true master. He doesn't always interact with the true master. But if he can do it with this trivial matter, he can do it in the bigger, greater sense for his master in heaven, okay? Uh, it's a very real, very real thing to consider there. Question number six. Oh, man. Come on, you've got to get this one, okay? You've got to get this one. Question number six. What is the ultimate motivation for the bond servant's submissive spirit? Bible class answer, number one. What is it? Jesus. Okay, there it is, guys. You look through this whole section, how many times does he say, as to Christ or as to the Lord, uh, from the Lord? Guys, just, I mean, over and over and over again, it's like every other... Uh, statement, he's got to tuck in something about Jesus here. Because Jesus is the reason. Jesus is the motivation behind the servant serving his master. Jesus is the motivation for a, a virtuous service as opposed to a hypocritical service, like Dennis pointed out. Jesus does this. Jesus served masters that were cruel and violent. Jesus submitted to, to people who took power and abused it over him. Okay, But he did it out of a submissive spirit. Um, very much, think back to Pilate and Jesus' interaction with him in John, 7, or John 18 and 19. You would have no power at all over me if it were not given to you from on high. Guys, that's what we're talking about. This person has no power over you, and yet you are to submit to them because King Jesus sets the example. He's the reason, okay? Now, question number seven. What is the reason Paul offers to the masters for the same behavior? I heard it. Yeah, it's Jesus. It, yeah, and you could, you could maybe kind of work that a different angle. We're still talking about Jesus. If you start saying, well, because he's a master, he should em emulate the master in heaven. Okay, we're still talking about Jesus. <laughs> no matter how elaborate your answer may get here, the answer is still Jesus. All right? Well, let's work through this text. 
we got these nine verses to consider. I've got a few applications for you to think about that I think will be helpful to us in our study and in our service. Verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, I, w- I want you to appreciate Part of the reason he, he turns to talk about children in this context is because he's just been talking about the family unit. Now, ultimately, he was talking about Christ and the church. We get that. A sub-point that he uses to illustrate and, and make that point more impactful is to talk about the home, husband and wife. So now he's going to turn it a little bit, and he's going to talk about children. That is an intricate part of the husband and wife relationship, is the children and how the children interact with mom and dad, and how the children are are instructed and raised, okay? All of that's the home. So children, obey your parents in the Lord. The phrase in the Lord is the catalyst for this discussion. See, children don't obey parents just because they're bigger and stronger and smarter than they are. They ultimately obey their parents because God said so. Don't we always love that answer? Uh, Because God said so. Um, now, that works with God. doesn't always work as a parent, because I said so. Well, you're not God. So, we've got to be really careful about this. The authority invested in us is because God put it there. We lead the children because it's right. They obey parents because it's right. Um, you know, sometimes we, we overcomplicate, uh, I almost said the word wrong, which would have been even funnier, uh, overcomplicate the issue. But notice the little bitty three words he puts on the end of verse 1. This is right. Sometimes, guys, we like to talk about the gray area. When the fact is, there are a whole lot of issues out there that are just plainly and simply right or wrong. Okay? And maybe part of our job as parents is helping helping children navigate that. Uh, Read a really good book. You're probably going to hear me refer to it a lot today at different points between the class and in the sermon. Uh, It it was a book on parenting. I read it Thursday and Friday of last week. Really, really, really thought-provoking stuff about your children looking at you and needing those those pointers, needing those directives, because they're trying to figure out what's right and wrong. And even when they get into teenage years, they're still trying to figure out what is right and what is wrong. And a mom and a dad's job is to tell them, this is wrong, this is right. But guys, here's why it's wrong. Here's why it's right. We need to do a good job of that. Okay, that, 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 never really, that never really ends. Look at verse 2, because all of this is still part of that same discussion. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Now, obviously, you're seeing some, some pull from, the Deuteronomy, uh, from, from Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 5, verse 16, and you're seeing some of the pull from the law it's interesting, though, he says this is the first commandment. Um, there's some discussion about that, and it's really hard to kind of nail down what, what, it, what it really means, because uh, the first of the commandments is to have no other gods before God. And so what does that really mean here? Well, it, it very well might be as simple as this is the first commandment children learn, okay? Okay. Um, not real sure. You, you might have a different thought on that, but, but that's kind of where I'm leaning with it right now. So this is the first thing children learn. You are the authority that they relate with the most. And you are the authority that they are accountable to, that they have to answer to. For the biggest majority of their, of their, of their growing up years, and, and so you are the authority that they relate all other authorities back to. Now, think about this very simple terms. When they get into middle school and teacher so-and-so says X, who do they go back to and say, is that right? Mom and dad. So you're the authority they always go back to. So maybe that's kind of what this is getting at. The first commandment with promise is really about the, the, the first form of authority that they have, to, they have to respect, which is really, really important. Okay? Really, really important. Um, all of this reference to, to parenthood is so vitally important because of some of the points we've already made. This is who they're going to relate God back to as well. Um, I've talked about this a lot at different points, but, but if, you are, uh, if you are an overbearing father, you are a cru- I'll take the extreme illustration here. You are a cruel father, 
their view of God will oftentimes be a cruel God. Because the only father they've ever known has been cruel to them. And so, you see some of these same images that's used here. And they're really important. Honor your father and mother. Why? Because ultimately they're supposed to honor the father. And if they can't learn, if you can't help them to honor father and mother, they, they may never learn to honor the true father. Um, man, I, I'd love to preach on that, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to right now. So, verse 3. That it may be well with you, you may live long on the earth. Okay, a lot about that is probably still coming from Deuteronomy because there was, a, there was an immediate application of these points. If Israel, when they went into Canaan and they took possession of the land, if they would honor their father and their mother, if they would keep the commandments with the promise of what those commandments would bring, what would happen to them? They would live long on the earth. They would live long and prosper, for you Star Trek fans. They would live long and prosper. So they would inherit Canaan and they would keep Canaan. Canaan. But what ultimately happened? Didn't keep any of that stuff. Why? Because of a breakdown here. Um, we, we like to harp on our society. Folks, our society is the way it is because of a breakdown of the home. Okay? Plain and simple. A breakdown of the home. If the home is good, then the country will be good. Okay? Look at that in the history of Israel. Israel did this. Israel did this exact thing. Uh, think about it just even in terms of David. When David's house went into shambles, what happened to the country? The country would, would temporarily go into shambles. Other nations would come in and take They would drive off inhabitants. Uh, his own son Absalom would take the throne. All of his house went into calamity, then all the nation went into calamity. That's the way it is, folks. Okay? I, I want us to, to look at verse 4 here. So, man, he makes some pretty hard points already. Some hard points. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Verse 4. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. You know, in the context here, that demands more of fatherhood than oftentimes our culture does. It demands more of fatherhood than oftentimes Christian fathers are doing. Because here, here, here's what it says to me. Ooh, that sounded very personal and subjective. Here's what it says. Okay? This is not just about a personal interpretation of this text. I've already made the point. He uses the term parents, verse 1. Now he specifically calls on fathers. So here's what this demands. Fathers are the chief authority in the home. Isn't that what we talked about in chapter 5? Who's the head of the house? Oh, I'm going to make you answer this one. Who's the head of the house? The husband. The father. So don't you see, even in the context of Ephesians 5 and 6, why he would call on fathers? Fathers, make sure you're being careful about how you exercise your authority. Why? Because the father is the head of the house. He's the leader. He is not the backseat driver. He's, if we take the illustration, he's in the driver's seat. Now, she might offer a lot of help, and she might offer a lot of suggestions, and he might, if he's wise, will listen to her counsel. But he's still behind the wheel. That also means he's behind the wheel when it comes to what's happening in the back seat. Too often, guys, uh, and I'm not chiding anybody in this room, I don't know. Too often, men will sit in the back seat while mom tells the kids what they should and should not do. Guys, this verse, this verse alone calls us to higher things, calls us to put out a little more effort, to be where we're supposed to be and lead the way we're supposed to lead. Okay? Doesn't say mothers. He doesn't say parents. He calls us right onto the carpet and says, Fathers, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Fathers, you need to be involved in your children's lives. It is not mom's job to discipline the kids. She may have to sometimes, but chiefly and ultimately, it is daddy's job to discipline the children. I want you to also think, so you don't exacerbate them, which is what's kind of going on here. Too often we take the extreme approach. Probably everybody in this room knows of a situation where a father was too extreme, made too many rules. Generally, rules are not the problem, though. Generally, hypocrisy is the problem. But he makes too many rules and doesn't necessarily give the whys, the reason behind rules. Well, that's going to do exactly what this text says you shouldn't do. You're going to make the children 
uh, frustrated. You're going to exacerbate them because they never know what's right. They never know what's wrong. That's part of this discussion. So what you're supposed to do is carefully exercise your authority. The, the positive here, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Have you known fathers who say, well, it's, it's her job to teach them this. It's her job to show them that. No, sir. Not what this text says. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up. Fathers, folks, we're still talking about fathers. Uh, it's a shame, guys, that, that dad will sit there with little kids and he'll let his wife do a little devotional Bible reading with them at bedtime. That's the woman's job. You know, I'm, I'm going to stay in here and watch football instead and let her do the Bible story at night. I'm going to let her talk about biblical things. No, sir, you better take the lead on this. That's your job. It is your job to be in there on the floor telling them about Cain and Abel. It's your job. You're supposed to be bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay? You're the authority in the home. You need to lovingly and sacrificially exercise it. Um, even when they're little and their mama is taking the lead on really cutesy little Bible readings and stuff, it's still your job to make sure what's going on is what's supposed to be going on. Okay? Now, I want you to think. That's the way authority works in every other realm. In the local church here. I get up and teach what I have studied and what I have prepared, but who ultimately has the... No, don't... Okay. Who uh, temporarily, not ultimately, but temporarily has the authority in what's taught here? Our elders. Now, ultimately, see why I made this distinction? Ultimately, Jesus has the authority. That's the way it is in the home, too. Jesus has the ultimate authority over what I teach in the home. But then my job as dad, my job as head of household, my job as the father is to oversee the teaching program of the home, okay? Well, I mean, we could just really take that in a lot of directions, but we don't, we don't really have time. Did you have something, Dennis? Yeah. 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 Makes an important point. If you're not agreeing to work together on this, you're doomed for failure. Now, you might stay married, and you might get your kids through school, but you're still doomed for failure. I'm going to take that one step further. If you are a Christian, okay? If you are a Christian, husband is a Christian, wife is a Christian. Wife, if he's doing what's right, you don't have a choice. You better get in behind and follow his lead. That's what we spent two classes talking about. Now, he may have to do everything perfect, and this is where you have to exercise some wisdom. Helping, encouraging, nudging, helping him do better and do more. But your job is still to submit to his authority in the home. Okay? It's what it is, folks. Uh, questions on le at least the first few verses there. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah. Those little eyes see how you do things. Yep. They see how you react to consultation. Yep. They see how you react to paying your taxes. Yep. They see how you react to the song leader not leaving the song you want to leave. Yeah. They hear all of those things and they form opinions based on what they see you demonstrate. Yep. I I tell you what, guys, I love that point. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna illustrate that point. Eyes are watching you if they're in the home. I'm going to illustrate this. I, had a, uh, ooh, I need to be careful here how I say this. I had a young man I graduated high school with. Loved, 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 loved him. He was mentally challenged. And he was big. And when I say big, I don't mean six foot. I mean big. Okay? Well over six feet. He, he made some racist comments about Barack Obama when Obama was president. He was the sweetest, kindest soul in the whole world. That did not come from him. 
It came from who he was around, who he was watching, and who he was following. He will post scripture all the time. But there was a disconnect, and he didn't realize it because he was just repeating what had been said to him. You see the point, guys? They're watching. They form opinions. That was the phrase Larry used. They are forming opinions about everything by watching you. You leave this morning saying how long Devin preached. Guess what's going to happen in a few years? They're going to notice how long Devin preached. They're going to gripe about how long Devin preached. That's the way it is. You're going to gripe about how long the song service went or how uh, Lewis led all 17 verses of Amazing Grace and we didn't even know nine of them. Okay, guess what? They're going to leave services one day thinking, Lewis picked 17 verses of Amazing Grace, and we didn't even know nine of them. They're going to repeat what you say. This is critically important, guys. You want them to love the Lord and love the local church? You need to uh, love the Lord and love the local church. You want them to value being a member of a congregation? You need to value being a member of a congregation. They're going to learn that from you, or they won't learn it at all, more than likely. That's the way it is, guys. You don't like the job? You remember the point from marriage stuff the last two classes? You don't like the job? Don't sign up for it. You don't like the responsibility of parenthood? Um, You better invest in some preventative measures. Okay? You don't like what it is to be a husband, what it is to be a wife? Do not agree to it. But the time to hate those commandments is before you are bound to them. Okay? Not after you've agreed to them. You got parents, you got kids in the home, that's your duty, folks. All right, uh, go ahead. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, Bonnie asked me the other day, what about kids who are raised by parents who aren't Christians? And I go, well, baby... Number one, that's a great question from an eight-year-old. But number two, they're going to be expected to do exactly what's right in the situation. And hopefully one of these days, somehow, some way, they will be exposed to the truth. Okay, there it is. Uh, Dennis, final word on this. We're going to move on. Yeah. Yeah, and be the kind of person who can spend a lot of time with them and leave a good impression. (laughs) You know, they're going to walk like Dad. They're going to slip on his cowboy boots when he's taking them off at the end of the day. Guys, I mean, they do all of that because they want to be like you. Um, Fathers especially, man, this is something that's weighed on me since I became a father. I share a title with God. Only two beings in the universe my children call Father. Who are they? Me and God. Guys, that is a heavy, heavy, heavy burden. Make sure you're doing your best to live up to it. You don't have to be perfect. Only God the Father is perfect. But you better make sure they know a perfect Father. Because when you fail them, they need Him. Okay? A lot more we could say on that. A lot more I'd love to say on that. But we're going to leave it alone for now. All right, verse 5. So he shifts this discussion just a little bit. Servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of your heart as to Christ. So he shifts this to to the servant-master relationship. Every, uh, uh, you've got this situation here. You've got Peter making comments about this in 1 Peter. You've also got Paul making comments about this in Colossians. This was a part of their world, a part of their life. How many Christians were slaves? How many Christians were masters? So this was a very, very practical thing of daily life for them, okay? So, so servants, you are obedient to your masters with fear and trembling, okay? That's not just about reverence. Otherwise, the word trembling probably wouldn't be there. So you're afraid of what they can do to you. You're submissive to them. You're obedient to them. Here's why, though. In sincerity of your heart, as to Christ. I want you to observe something, folks. God asks us to do hard things. You notice, uh, she said escape clause a minute ago with the kids. You notice there's no escape clause here? Slaves are to be submissive to their masters. Well, wait, 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 Paul. What if your master is not a Christian? Doesn't say there, does it? 
No escape clause, folks. By the way, Peter makes the same point. What do you do? You continue on. You are submissive, you are obedient, you are faithful because ultimately you're faithful to King Jesus. Guys, God sometimes asks you to stay in situations that are not very fun. Now, here, here's, here's where we really struggle with this. Wait a minute. God wouldn't want me to be in a situation that would be questionable. God wouldn't want me to be in a situation that, 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 that's, that's awful. I'm miserable. I'm unhappy. Okay, well, we're going to have a little trouble with Jesus then, aren't we? Because what did Jesus do? Jesus left the throne of heaven, left the glories of heaven, walked in human flesh where I suppose he was uncomfortable from time to time. <laughs> that was sarcasm. Then, in the last few days of his life, he was in supreme uncomfort. Discomfort? I don't know. Think about that. And then, dies on a cross. Oh, so God wouldn't want Jesus to go, or God wouldn't want you to go through a difficult time, but allows his only begotten son to go through a difficult time? Come on. Come on, come on, come on. It's a selfish view. Now, I'm not saying that it's not tough. I think Paul would acknowledge from statements like he's making here, it's tough. But God has the right to ask of us some tough things, okay? Servants are obedient to their masters because of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6. So not with eye service as men pleasers, so that's that hypocritical attitude. We're just going through the motions. As long as the master's watching, we're going to do what's right. But the minute he turns his back, we are going to kind of do our own thing. No, sir. We're doing it because we're servants of Christ. We're doing the will of God from the heart. We do what's right because we love God, and we want Him to be happy with us. Plain and simple. What's right is sometimes really, really, really difficult. Doesn't change the rules, folks. The difficulty level doesn't change the rule. Our duty is to still be faithful to King Jesus. Verse 7, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. How many times does he have to kind of double us back to that concept? We do what's right because Jesus Christ. We do what's right because Jesus Christ. Oh, guess what? I'm going to say it again. We do what's right because of Jesus Christ. So look at verse 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Now, boy, you could take that verse out of context pretty easy, couldn't you? That almost sounds like health and wealth gospel, doesn't it? You know, you just do what's right. You, you know, you tithe. I caught this one uh, on a Facebook reel yesterday. If you'll tithe, you'll end up in a mansion. Oh, man. Uh, that's at least what Jesse Duplantis teaches. So, that's not what this verse is about, though, is it? It's about that chief motivator behind everything we've been talking about. You're going to do what's right even when it's really, really difficult. You're going to do what's right because Jesus Christ said so. And at the end of the day, no matter what we receive here, we'll ultimately receive him and all of that he has there. That's why we do what we do. So look at verse 9. Now I want you to understand something, folks. Verse 9 is here in the event that we have a master who is a Christian. That wasn't always going to be the case, folks. In fact, my strong suspicion is there were a whole lot more slaves serving Christians who were not, or serving masters who were not Christians than there were slaves serving masters who were Christians. Just because of the way the world works. So verse 9 he says, So you masters, do the same things to them giving up threatening, knowing that your own master is also in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. So masters, you're supposed to do the same thing from the other direction. You are kind, you are gracious, you are compassionate, because he is no longer simply your slave, he is your brother in Christ. You remember something similar to that? Yeah, that's exactly it, Philemon. Folks, that's exactly Paul's point in Philemon. So receive him back. He's no longer your slave, Onesimus. Uh, he's no longer your slave, Philemon. Onesimus is your brother in Christ. That relationship governs all others. Okay? So, we need to remember who we are, even in positions of authority, like a master over his slave. Ultimately, we serve Master King Jesus, who is in heaven. And with him, there is no partiality. He does not care whether you are a master whether you are a slave, whether you are free, whether you are oppressed, doesn't matter. He will reward you the same 
for service done in his name. Okay? Questions on any of that? Phyllis? You, you know how far it goes, Phyllis. Let me give you an illustration. Leading the witness. Objection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely does. Okay, so, so let, me, let, me, let me not answer your question, but instead give you an illustration. I don't think there's anything wrong with a husband deferring to a wife who is wise on points. There are things she knows a whole lot more about than I do. If a husband is wise, he will defer to her in her wisdom. But the same is true when ultimately she needs to respect his authority. He's gathered all the information, he makes the judgment. There's also other times where she doesn't need to have a whole lot of say in it because he has wisdom on this point. Let me give you a, a thing. Oh, now you're getting in a muddy area. No, 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 no. You're going you're to get this. Comes to a mechanical repair on a car. Should he spend a whole lot of time consulting what she thinks about alternators? Whether it, you know, Should I get a new one or a rebuilt one? Uh, should I go to O'Reilly's or AutoZones? I'm sorry, but that's not necessarily a point where we need to consult a whole lot on unless she has been to trade school to work on cars, and I haven't. See the difference? There's times where you can defer, and there's times where he needs to exercise his authority. To the point with the Bible study, there's nothing wrong, especially when they're little. There's nothing wrong with deferring to her and letting her teach the little ones. But be cautious about that. There's sometimes, guys, of course, I've not had that luxury, okay? Y'all know my situation. I've not had that luxury. But it also has been very precious to me to get down on the floor and do a little devotional with my girls every night. I have loved that time. And you want to talk about making a difference in a child's life, daddy is not above getting on the floor and talking about the women of the Bible, talking about some of these great women who, who are blazed the trail of faith before us. That's my job too. So I'm not going to defer a whole lot when it comes to spiritual things. I'm going to take the charge and I'm going to lead. Now, do I think it's wrong to sometimes defer? No. But you need, to, you need to not relinquish your right to teach your children. Okay? That probably didn't answer all of that. But go ahead, Dennis. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and and here's, a, here's a fair point to make as well in this discussion. There, there's too often situations where a wife does know more than her husband because he's not doing his job. Okay, I'm not sugarcoating that. Now, granted, he may have come to the faith later than she did. That's fine. Then he's got some growing up to do. Right? Now... If they've both been raised in the church and she still knows more than he does, maybe that's difference of circumstances, difference of spiritual faith, difference of drive, whatever. He's got some big boy doing to do, okay? He's going to have to grow up. His job is to lead the home spiritually, physically, temporally, all realms, folks. His job is to lead. So if he's not equipped to lead yet, he needs to get to working, okay? I'm not sugarcoating that. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for a man who won't stand up and lead his family. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I know that that's uh, not politically correct in our world today. I don't really care because it's biblical. A man is to lead his family. And too often, way too often, he relinquishes his leadership because he is too passive. And once in a while, maybe we need a little bit of the caveman come out, okay? He needs to lead his household, and he needs to make sure they're on the right track. 
Let, we, we can say a lot more about that, but we're going to run out of time. Let, let's make a few applications. I'm hoping that some of this will help. The servants and the master relationship is oftentimes brought into the modern world in the relationship of an employee and an employer. That's fair, but there are some cautions we need to make about that as well. So let me give you a few applications from some of this. I got six for you. We'll spend more time on a couple, and we're going to nearly bypass a few others. Number one, some things we do simply because it's the right thing to do. You know, once in a while, we just need to make that point. Why are we doing it that way? Because God said so, and it is right. Okay? You know, why do you, why do you stay put and work in a marriage? Because it's the right thing to do. Not because it makes you so happy in the moment, okay, but because it's right. Number two, obeying God, uh, hmm, I love that typo, obeying God's commands are for our good. You, you may skip over that if you're not careful, but folks, that's really the point being made in verses 2 and 3. You obey the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Well, okay, you obey your mom and dad doesn't mean you're going to live to be 117. Okay, nobody's surprised by that. But what it does mean is obeying God's commands are for our good. Seems like the Bible talks about that a little bit, doesn't it? That was sarcasm. It does. Okay. Number four, or number three, fathers have the authority over the children. The final say. Men, you need to step up and lead your family. Okay. Um, it's your job. Your job. You're going to counsel and you're going to seek wisdom from your wife. If you're not doing that, you are a fool. She's got a whole lot to say, and on a whole lot of points, she's a whole lot smarter than you. She may be smarter than you on every point, okay? Uh, maybe personal experience expresses that a little bit. But you have the authority. You need to lead your household, okay? Number four, fathers are the primary educator and disciplinarian. Guys, I mean, Paul nearly comes out and says that, doesn't he? He almost says it in those terms because he says in verse four, fathers... Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. That is fathers. Not, not parents, fathers. She may need to do that job more and sometimes, but ultimately and chiefly that is his job. Okay? Uh, number five. Oh, wait a minute. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want you to understand something, folks. Some of what I'm saying is old-fashioned, isn't it? You can, you can admit it. It's old-fashioned thinking. You, you appreciate, folks, that that old-fashioned mentality that was so prevalent in our culture 120 years ago was because it was founded in biblical principles, okay? More so than our world is today. The wife does not lead the household. The wife does not dictate how the husband lives and operates. There is a structure even in the home. Husband leads the wife, and they lead the children, but he is ultimately and chiefly responsible for that. Number five. We sincerely serve others as ultimately serving Christ. Here's where that gets into some application into, into your workplace. You don't do your job well only when the boss is watching. That's just not how you do it. Well, I'm going to be really, really, you know, I'm going to work really hard right now because he's watching. The minute he turns his back, I'm going to prop my feet up and I'm going to take it easy. That ain't how it works, folks. You're working hard all the time, because ultimately and cheaply you're serving Christ. One second. Number six, all we do, we do for Christ. You see how that all comes together now? Guys, that's what binds this entire section together. The way our home operates, the way we work in the workplace, the way our, our kids go to school. All realms, all places, all relationships are dictated chiefly by Jesus Christ. Okay? We need to make sure we are rooted in that truth. Jesus governs me in every way. Bickley? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. I honestly thought you were going to break into he sees you while you're sleeping. Um, <laughs> but but the, the point is absolutely valid. Folks, your boss sees you. Remember, that's kind of what he's talking about, isn't it? You're serving the master because of the master. So you're not just doing this as, as men pleasers with, with lip service. You're not just doing this to get by some kind of hypocritical service. You're ultimately and chiefly serving King Jesus. Okay? And by the way, all of the positives are mentioned here. Don't forget the negative. 
Your master will hold you accountable to him. Okay? I appreciate your attention. We'll jump into verses 10 and following on uh, Wednesday night. Thank you for your thoughts and comments as well.